Good afternoon. Hope you had a good lunch. We're in the home stretch now, and I'm proud to uh, introduce our next panel, of which I'm actually a part. It's the role of media and sustainability, and to lead us through that, please welcome the executive editor of Travel Weekly, Ian Taylor. I'll go sit over there. Thank you, uh, Peter. This is the uh, session where you get to beat up on the media if you've a mind to, because there's going to be five journalists on stage. So I really would like questions from the audience. Um, please welcome the panelists on, onto the stage. Peter Greenberg, you know, because he's been talking all, all for two days to us. Uh, Rajan Data. Uh, who from the BBC. Rajam, please join us on stage. Maggie Mutezi, managing editor and producer of Manza Media Africa, please join us. And Sherry Sandor Kelly, who's an investigative reporter who, who's done work for the New York Times and Forbes magazine. I've got to say, that is the worst music to walk onto stage to that I've ever heard. I mean, can we change that for future years, please? It's dreadful. Um, okay, so this session's going to be 30 minutes. D disregard what the, the program uh, says. And I want to start with Peter and Rajan, because they've been asking questions for two days now and, and without having to answer any, which seems uh, unjust. So, uh, Peter, I want to start with you. What is the role of the media in uh, developing travel industry sustainability? Well, it, starts, it doesn't start with advocacy. It starts with awareness. And once you can educate the people as to exactly what the issues are, and the biggest problem is making it relevant to their lives. The biggest problem that media has right now, and I'll even use my own network as an example, is five years ago, if we were covering a story, whatever that story was, when we came back to the home stage, right, home base, and the table where the anchors sit, there'd be one additional person at the table. That would be a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker, a lawyer, a doctor, me, someone who's an expert in their field to explain to the audience about what they just saw, six words, what does this mean to you? Today, most media doesn't do that. They just cover one story after another, and you're going from one bright, shiny object to another. And I think we've, we've made some mistakes there, because if we can't explain what it means to anybody, first of all, they're not going to watch. And second of all, they're not going to learn. And third of all, they're not going to be able to embrace that idea and, and make it a part of their lives. So that's our, our, our first obligation. Now, advocacy, we'll find the advocates. That's the easy part. But if we can't explain it, then we failed. Okay, why has that happened? If five years ago there was an explainer, why, why isn't there an explainer now? Well, I, I could talk about six hours on that one. But uh, briefly, because this is something we'll come back okay. to, because it's an important okay, I'll, part I'll, of I'll the... I'll tell you the answer. It's the internet. It's the internet because people think the answer is always there. And for the people who work for me in my office, I have a rule. The internet has not been invented. It doesn't exist. It's not available to you. If you can't use the phone and talk to somebody, it gets back to something we have been talking about for the last two days here. You have to have a conversation. And we've lost that art. And many in the media have lost that art, right? They think there's an app for that. Take that app and throw it out. Learn how to speak, learn how to ask questions, do it the old fashioned way, and then you're making a difference. Okay, but you can, you can speak and ask questions Digitally, can't you? you? You can do that, but, but, but let's come back to this But if you depend issue. on it, you lose. Okay. R Rajan, what, what's the role of the media in terms of travel sustainability? Okay, let's just deal with the role of the media full stop, first of all, in terms of how it reflects issues around sustainability, around climate change. Let's not forget that actually only up until quite recently, the whole notion of looking at climate change was this idea of impartiality, so that we actually had climate change deniers coming on in, onto programmes to give one side of the argument. That's only recently changed. I mean, the BBC, for example, it's, it's one of the things they say you don't need 
objectivity or impartiality on that, a bit like with racism and, and other things. Climate change is happening, it's been accepted. The, the, I think Peter just touched on something quite interesting there, which is that you've got to relate it to uh, ordinary people. And again, I think the BBC, <clears throat> excuse me, is doing that a little bit better. So it is saying, so your average family, what does this actually mean? You know, so we're now going into the carbon footprint and, we're, and, and they're making it more palatable, if you like. There was the danger of blinding you with science when it came, came to climate change, being, feeling like you're being told off all the time. Uh, this morning, there was some interesting point made about the doom effect. In other words, if you overload people with stuff about how the planet's about to collapse, you know, they just go, no, I'm, I don't want to think about it. They want to run away from it. So you've got to be very careful how you, how you do that. With the travel show, that the show that I'm, I do in terms of travel on the BBC, they definitely do have every piece pretty well has to make sure that it is touching on something to do with sustainability. Um, we did something about the ski slopes, quite interestingly, about how artificial snow uh, is causing a problem, water cannon, uh, sorry, snow cannons, um, and all that stuff. Um, and then we do something about peat bogs in Estonia and how peat bogs are actually very good for carbon capture and they could bring in the back. So, look, so these are, they're related to tourism, but they do have to tick that box. That's, I think that's certainly true. I think the BBC, is, to a certain extent, is leading the way in that sense. And it goes back to something that we were talking about yesterday, which is public service versus commercial uh, stations uh, or commercial or print or whatever, where they've got uh, advertisers to to deal with and make sure they've got the income. Um, so, the, the last thing I'll say on this point is: Are we thought leaders, influencers, or are we reflecting what people think? What is the role of the media generally? What what should we be doing? Should we should is the is an interesting word. Should we be telling people what to think, or should we just reflect what is going on in the world? around us. Okay, well, you've asked a question rather than answer it, haven't you? What, what should you be doing? Um, <laughs> I got it. Well, if you... <laughs> I'm a journalist, I don't have views. Um, <laughs> um, you, well, I think because, yes, you have to accept that, you know, um, it is a serious problem, and I think, yes, you do go on the side of a bit like anti-racism or sexism yeah. or whatever else. You do go hard on, look, this is causing big problems, we have got to, to broadcast programmes that highlight that. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to you, Peter, if, if I'm... Fine. Remember the point. <laughs> remember the point, please. And I also want to come back on the question of our objectivity, but Maggie, first. Well, if you can say something briefly, just explain, Maggie, uh, your, your, your company, yeah. and, and then say what you see as the role of the media in travel sustainability. Um, um, managing Edison for Mansa Media, and what we do is basically market entry into Africa, but through st storytelling, because... We understand that there is a sudden lack of information about the African continent, and obviously if even hundreds of media houses in, in, in our own perspective, we feel like there are certain areas they haven't been, reached, uh, been able to reach out to. So through what we do, we hope that we can be able to give that information to not just investors, but also uh, traders or you know, Africans themselves in, in a way to you know, promote integration, trade, uh, investments, uh, and all of that. To come back to you on the role of the media, and if I touch on that, I just want to respond to Peter. We cannot uh, dismiss new media. I, I run a platform that is on digital, and I, I know it's, it can be a debate for an entire day. Um, and obviously, I think it's about looking at how to 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 incorporate the two or be able to integrate the two, uh, be able to use the digital platforms while also uh, verifying the sources. Because I understand with using digital, there is, there is the, the risk of also getting fake news because you don't know where that information has actually come from. But that's where verification comes in. And I think for me, how we operate, for example, 55 African countries, you can't send everybody to another country. You're gonna spend, I don't know how much money you're gonna spend, to, you spend on airtime or calling people to be able to get information, but it's easier to send a DM to Instagram somebody and be able to speak to them. So, ah, but you just said it though. Uh, you send them an email to do what? To speak uh, to them. Okay. Yes. No, I'll let that, you respond. That starts Peter, with the digital part of it. Now let me get to the role of the media. We're going to come back to that. Uh. I think, I think, I think for me, I don't even want to say the role of the media. I would rather rephrase it. What is the role of storytellers? 
in this entire dynamics because think about it. We're talking about uh, storytellers who literally are supposed to be at the forefront of educating the masses, the audiences about climate change, sustainability, and we're in a room that is not even a quarter, a quarter full, like uh, nobody really wants to listen to what the, the media has to say because we are reporters, but we're not supposed to be reporters. We're supposed to be part of the process because how best are you gonna report a subject you don't really understand? So for me, I always feel like we need to move away from just looking at the media as reporters, as just people that you know, send the information back, but how can we work together with policy, with the experts to be able to understand issues better and obviously uh, be able to report them better? Because the reason we have fake news is because we just hear say, okay, this is it. But we, do, do you get to speak to scientists, engage? Do they engage with you and say, hey, Peter, how do we convey this message out? Uh, how do we get the people to really understand uh, you know, sustainability, the, the impacts of climate change? I come from a continent where we were struggling from being able to tell our own stories. The narrative is just left, right, center. We don't even know how to, to face it. And I can go on for hours, but you know. Yeah, but don't, <laughs> uh, because we haven't got hours. Yeah. Um, look, I'll let you come back, Peter, but I just wanted to say on the term storytellers, I, I personally dislike it. Um, I, I think it's a well-intentioned term, but stories can be fiction. You know, it's not, uh, I'm interested in news, not, I, but uh, no, you can reply when you come back. Just a little bit of that. No, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, no, I, I, I won't let it happen, Ian. And I, for me, the reason I say storytellers is because we have, a, there's barely 28% internet penetration in my, in, in my continent. We have millions of people that probably do not watch TV. All they have access to is musicians, is you know storytellers. I, I but understand. how? So, so for me, I feel like we have to really broaden this understanding of the media. Are you just a journalist, or are you just are you a storyteller? And this is where I'm coming in. But again, we, okay. we and can, I would I would add to response. that. I would add to that. We, we're talking about facts, and then then you all news is stories. It's a narrative that exactly. someone's created. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We we'll talk about this afterwards. Now, I, I need to come to, to um, uh, Sherry. Uh, what do you see as the role of the media? In I think the role of the media is to just gather the information, put it in a way where it's accessible for them to compartmentalize it, and then they can make their decisions on whether they want to actually research it for themselves, or if they don't want to read it, they don't read it. But you have to give them everything that you find and give it to them out front, and you have to be honest about it. And you kind of have to give each each side, like each each position, good or bad, give them every option. I think the role of the media is to be honest. I think it's to be transparent. I think it's to be upfront. I think you, but I think in in my role, I look at everything, every aspect. You know? So, so you you would in your role do what what um, Rajan was critical of which yeah. was having somebody who would put a counter view to w whatever you're presenting. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm saying that... <laughs> did you say that? <laughs> well, he, Rajan, Rajan said that it, in, in, you know, because of the demand for objectivity right, right, right. in journalism, oh, right. there, for, until quite recently, there was always somebody who would deny the reality of climate. Right. climate change, well, even a, on the BBC. And there's this is, this there's is always going to be cl fact. climate deniers, there's mm -hmm. always going to be climate realists, there's always going to be climate terrorists, there's always going to be people who, you know, who protest just to protest, and they don't know what they're protesting about. When you ask someone what is climate change, they have no idea. When you ask someone what is a carbon footprint, no idea. Carbon offset? No. Nope. Do you know what Stockholm, Stockholm Convention is? No. Nope. Do you know who Maury yeah. Strong is? So no. Nope. You have a particular problem with this in the United States, don't you? Very, very, a, a very big problem, yes. So how do you address that? How do I address that? Well, honestly, most of the people in America, they look to, uh, they don't really watch the news, and if they do watch the news, they believe it, they take it as fact. Mm -hmm. And they, they, and then they, and then they, they like spout it out, you know, as, as I'm not, I don't wanna talk about Trump, but during whatever happened with Trump, you know, they had, um, you know, it was, it was a complete, um, it was almost a hypocrisy. Okay. Let, let me uh, let me just jump in. Yeah. This is where I'm going to take over for a second. In America, <laughs> people watch the news that confirms their own pre-existing prejudices. Why? We, because we're siloed. It's because certain, the people on the left watch MSNBC, the people on the right watch Fox, the people who don't know what they're doing watch something else. But the point is, 
it's not about our role. Our role is the people in this room in the travel industry, most of you would define your role as promoting your destination, your hotel, your experience, et cetera. That's not our role. Our role is to present it. Uh, and it's to give you the facts, not you, but the audience the facts, and hopefully they'll be able to make intelligent choices on their own based on those facts. So going back to what Maggie said, if you have 28% penetration of the internet in, in your country, that means the medium is the message, and the medium there is storytelling. The medium there is, and that's, and that's if I want to go to the source, please tell me a story, because I'm not going to depend on somebody taking something off the internet. I have the opportunity there to listen to stories that have been handed down yeah. from generation to generation to generation, and are as true today as they were when they were first mm -hmm. told. That, to me, is a gift. Okay, and what, and and what was, no, sorry, hang on. And what was the point you wanted to make uh, uh, Oh, earlier? the only point I wanted to make earlier was this. I don't dismiss new media, but I do not embrace it at, at, at the expense of common sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, Maggie, what did you want to say? I agree with that. Yes. I'm glad we agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I, I got to say one thing, though. I, I, as as a, I was addressing, you know, uh, responding to his question, I, I forgot one thing that, that is very important, and that's access to information and data. I think it's very critical. And um, as media storytellers, um, sometimes it's a struggle to actually find the right information on certain issues. Obviously, even when you go to ordinary people and you present something, at some point you have to give them a basis. You know, this is this. These are the facts that we have, and you know, how is this affecting you? And for me, from where I come from, this is a very big, very big issue. It's a it's a huge problem having access to that information or even the right data, and. Uh, Away from this, I can tell you for a fact that sometimes I go to Getty Images to look for pictures, for example, of a, a climate calamity somewhere in Africa, and I'll, and I'll find a bunch of pictures from the US, and I'm like, where is Africa? Where, where, where is this? And, and obviously, this, these are photos, but this is also photojournalism. It's, 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 it's just a, a, a revelation and a reiteration of what I feel like. There's no information out there. There's no data, but we have to really be able to have access to that information, the right information, like Peter said, to be able to also carry this story. You have to base it on something. Okay, Peter, I wanted to ask you of the point that, that um, Rajan raised about uh, objectivity and uh, the balance in, in reporting. Uh, certainly in, the U in Britain, until very recently, if you had a report about the climate crisis, you would inevitably have a climate change denier are on to, to, to appear with them, when in fact, if, if there was real balance, you would have had 99 scientists saying there is a climate crisis and one lobbyist arguing the, that it wasn't the, the problem they were being told about. But so how big an issue is, is this and, and what should be done about it? Well, let's take a look at the word objectivity. It's a joke. It doesn't exist. There's nobody on this panel who's objective. We just have to be very careful and responsible in how we report the news so we can be fair, right? If you think you're being objective, you're delusional. Yeah. We, all, we all bring to the party our background, our history, our family, our social circumstances, everything, and hopefully we can take a deep breath and figure out what's what, right? So the only really obligation that we have, and it is truly an obligation, is to be fair. So I won't have a problem, right? I won't have a problem with getting somebody else on the other side of an issue to talk about it. We just did a story, nothing to do with sustainability, but talking about storytelling. There's a song that was written many years ago, uh, which was actually, and by the way, it's now the state song of Kentucky, right? They sing it everywhere. They've branded all of their tourism around this song. It's a very sentimental song, the way we learned it. It's not the way it was written. The way it was written was a racist song about slavery and promotion of slavery and about slaves being sold. And the name of that song is My Old Kentucky Home. Every time the Louisville Derby, at the Kentucky Derby, they sing it. So what, we, what did we do? We went back to My Old Kentucky Home. We found the original lyrics, right? And what's interesting about that is we couldn't get anybody to perform the original lyrics to prove the point because it was not considered politically correct. Mm. But the whole point of the story mm. was to prove the history of the racism of the song, mm. right? So you know what? 
I finally went to a friend of mine and said, here's the lyrics, sing the song. I don't care how it sounds. I want people to hear it. So they understand how they cleaned up the lyrics later on to make it truly, a, with all due respect, a whitewash, right? So now we went back to the state of Kentucky to get their opinion, to give them a chance to talk. They chose not to speak, but at least we gave them the chance to talk. Yeah. Okay, well, th that's a very good, very good example. Rajan? I was just going to say, um, here's an interesting point. You said that um, in his issue with pluralism in the media, and with the states in particular, suppose you had a station, and it's not a million miles away from not existing, a station which did actually just deny climate change, that that was its whole agenda. And as you said, people watch things to reinforce their views. Suppose that station then got a big, big viewership. What do we do about that? There's nothing you can do about that. By the way, that station does exist. So, yes. <laughs> that station does, in fact, I should say, I'll take it back. Those stations do exist. Uh, there's always going to be an avenue for extreme views, right? And there should be, by the way. Uh, the question is we need somebody to give people the facts so they can, they can intelligently deliver it. But here's the biggest problem, and it's the elephant in this room. Who's watching to begin with? The real question is, where do people get their news, oh. right? Maggie talks about fake news. Just because it's on the internet doesn't mean it's true, but people are lazy. It's expedient. They can just hit a keyboard and there it is. That's why I told my staff, the internet, if I catch you going on the internet, you're fired because I can't trust it. Now, can I, can I trust it to get me somebody's phone number to talk to them? You bet. <laughs> and, but. It's interesting, if I ask my staff to say, hey, find me five restaurants in Chicago that we want to talk to, yeah. they'll go to the web. And yeah. three of those restaurants burn down, but they don't know that because yeah. it was listed on the web. So we have to go back to the future, and that is pick up the phone, talk to a human being, get two corroborating sources who are independent of each other. And that's what we were trained to do, right? And that's what we still do. The problem is today, who's training the journalists to do that? And the answer is, not many. Oh, oh, yeah. It's just certainly true that before the internet, and we're old enough to remember, um, we would have to phone bash. We would phone bash for stories. And, you know, we would get, yes, as you said, we would get opposite points of view. The easy thing to do now is to go on the internet for journalists. It's a, it's a shortcut and time pressure. News, you know, it's less and less staff producing more and more news. That, you know, in a way, I don't blame them. You do, you, it, it, you know, you can get straight to finding simple things, but when it gets to defining the complicated, nuanced stuff, you're right, talk to people and then say, they said this, they say that. By the way, today is Friday. It was a day I used to dread, because I worked for Newsweek, and our deadlines were Fridays. And why did I dread Friday? Not because of the deadline, but because I had to get on the phone at five o'clock in the afternoon and talk to the fact-checking department. I had to, they, had to, they looked at every word I wrote, every nuance, and made me prove it. I don't know there's a fact-checking department anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fact-checking, proofreading, all, all these things have gone. There's a, a very good book by a, a British journalist called Nick Davis, who uh, led the investigation into phone hacking by the n newspapers in, in Britain, um, called Flat Earth News, which was published in 2005, 2006, and he coined the term journalism for jur journalism. And Com, uh, commissioned a, a couple of academic studies of journalism in, in Britain, which makes points that are generalizable. So, f uh, for example, he, they found that journalists on the broadsheet newspapers, so the Financial Times, the Times, the Telegraph, these the sort of supposedly quality newspapers, were producing three times as much copy in 2005 as they were 20 years before, regardless of what they were doing also online. They were doing the online stuff in addition because of the reduction in the number of journalists. Wages were down overall by a significant margin, and as a consequence, the number of stories appearing in the quality press, which were essentially either verbatim press releases or rewrites of press releases without any checks or additional work was 80%. Four out of five of all the news stories in the quality papers was produced by PRs, basically. So, and that, that's, that, that's the, been the impact of the de-skilling, if you like, of um, the, the work um, 
overload of work on, on journalists just in the UK, but it will be similar uh, as, as Peter's describing. Um, I wanted to ask you something else, and maybe Maggie, you can uh, t take this up, but I'll be interested in other people's views. What, what about the tension between the duty to your audience yeah. and the duty to your advertisers? Because you're getting revenue from, from somewhere and their interests don't always match, do they? No, they don't. And I, I don't really want to complicate myself in this. <laughs> um, but I think it's... it's, uh, it's uh, like, like he mentioned, really, there's no objectivity. Uh, it's a lie. And I worked for the BBC, you know, even though we say we're objective, there are certain points I would say that's an objectivity, that's a lie, depending on where you're reporting the story. And if, as somebody who comes from Africa, I would have many case studies. Obviously, this is for another day. But um, I think for me, running a media business startup is probably one of the hardest things I've had to live, uh, to experience. And it's also really great to see how you really um, stay, because as a, as a company you have editorial guidelines. You have a vision and you have, um, every story has to be linked to, to that, uh, to your editorial. So honestly, I can say we're still figuring it, out, <laughs> figuring it out. But for me, what's very important and um, what we've done in the past is that the media business is absolutely zero advertising. Actually, we make our money from uh, events that we organize on the side and, uh, you know, partnerships that we take on with another arm that, you know, we do. <coughs> but when, we, when it comes to the news, that's something that we've decided because you can't, you can't, you can't mix profit with the news. I think that's where it all goes wrong because then you have to be accountable. Then that's when you run it. Aren't you still associated <coughs> with that sponsor of that event? In other words, and do they not influence so in some way what you... Published. No, 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 they are not. So the media is absolutely different. And we've decided to go a different model of uh, building a subscription, you know, based, you know, get an audience to grow, to be able to, to fund the media arm. But from what we've done and what I've seen in the past is that you absolutely cannot have partners with your media house. Because then they're going to influence everything. You're just going to. You can't have any, an editorial guidelines. You can't. Okay. I, I want to find out what Peter and Rajan think think about that. But but Sherry, you you are in a slightly different position because you're freelance, aren't, uh, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, so on the one level, it might it seem like that you don't have the pressure of <coughs> advertisers, but of course you know very well what sort of stories the New York Times or Forbes will will publish and what they what they won't. So it it will affect what. what what work you do, won't right. it? Yeah. And I think you have to be Hold the microphone. Use your mic, yeah. You have to be, you have to be, um, you kind of, a, it's, a, it's a game, it's a kind of like a, what, 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 what do you think of the climate of the times? What, what, what is the situation that it would be appropriate for? And you have to choose a story that will satisfy the actual, the time of the, the you know, the publication yeah, or the yeah, channel. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and you have to tailor it. And you have to say, will they like it? Will they not like it? Sometimes they don't. So they don't. And that's that's. The, but that's. So if you hold your mic. But that's like at the. You know that has to be at the. At a certain time, like at you know in May, they might not like a story that you know we did two months ago and a different topic. But you know the next month, it, it it's relevant. So it's always changing. Okay. Well, so you wait for the summer for the stories about extreme. <laughs> yeah. um, Peter, you've got views on this, I'm sure. Well, look, in the media world, the freelancers are the first guys to get killed. First of all, it's true, because they're the, they're the most expendable. Huh? You agree? Yeah, I agree. Okay. So that's the first problem. The, so, but actually, that means they have to be the more creative. Yeah. They have to figure out how to beat the media at their own game playing by their rules. And that's how I started as a freelancer. And so you, you figure it out, every, once again, there's no such thing as objectivity. So you have to figure out, very strategically, which editor likes the color blue and pitch them blue, right? And which editor hates yellow and don't go there, right? And you learn the, how to play that game by giving them something that they feel comfortable with. It's all about comfort level, not to mention accessibility and exclusivity, right? But it's a game that we all play. Because if we don't, no, even though I'm at CBS, they can turn down my stories any day they want. Yeah. 
and, and sometimes I have to figure out how to beat them at their own game with the same story. You, you must have more autonomy than most journalists, though, g given you know, your reputation and longevity and so on. Well, on the shows that I, that, I, that I produce and host, you bet. But when it comes to CBS News, I'm working with 30 people, right. all of whom are decision makers at a certain level, right? So you have to figure out how to work the room. It's no different. I mean, you have to be a salesman. Yeah. You have to be a salesman. Okay. Rajan, I wanted yeah. to ask you ab ab about that and also the, r the tension between advertising and, and editorial and so on. I mean, you, you, the BBC does model is, is different. Obviously, it's public service broadcasting, although there is increasingly some advertising. But when you, when you travel to places for the travel show, a lot of the time you're hosted and so on by, by com you know, commercial companies, aren't you? So, so t tell me about that tension well, and also make the point you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, there, there are rules about that. So we don't take discounts from hotels and all that kind of stuff. Um, we don't do free anything. You know, that's, I mean, it, I think sometimes because of budgetary pressures, and may, I pr I'm pretty sure some programs do bend that rule, but there is a basic rule. You don't do that. You don't take freebies or anything like that. So you're not influenced, not seen to be influenced. I just want to touch on something else, by the way. And it, it's what Peter was talking about. This editor likes yellow and this editor likes blue. Which is, don't forget the news itself is structured, is prioritized mm -hmm. in, in a way that where one person, the editor usually, is deciding that this story is the top story and we're going to give it six minutes. This story is the second story. So there is a narrative there. There's a judgment, subjective judgment being made. Now you could, on the front page of a newspaper, you put what you think your, list, your viewers, or sorry, your readers are going to want to read. So you might well put a celebrity scandal on your front page, not perhaps the climate change issue, uh, because people won't, won't, won't read it. I'll give you one great example. Yeah. When I was the West Coast correspondent for Newsweek, I knew that what newspaper they read in New York every morning to determine what they wanted to do at the magazine, it was the New York Times. And if they didn't see it in the New York Times, it didn't exist. So finally, I, I, I was so frustrated with one particular story I wanted to do, I did the unthinkable. I leaked it to the New York Times. When they ran it, I got to do my story. Yeah, that, that, you, that's a good, good uh, advice for journalists. Yes, Maggie. You know, it's interesting, you know, as, as you were mentioning that part of uh, the editorial judgment of which story to put first on the front page. I've, I've come across, uh, you know, that confusion. And, and I, even at the BBC, because uh, at some point I, I led a team also sending out content from Africa. And what I've realized is that um, uh, sometimes you send out a story thinking this is what actually the audience wants, but you get shocked with the feedback that you get from the stories. And even with Mansa, we've been focused so much on investment, finance, and, you know, and, and all of that trade. And I've realized that every time there is a story that has a political part of it uh, within, it's probably our biggest story, and it has the, the you know the, the the clicks, not just the clicks, but also the feedback we get is usually overwhelming. So now that comes that and that has probably kept us awake on how to structure our story so that even as we're sending out um, a story entirely not on politics, how do we put that ang accountability angle? I don't want to call it political, but we've realised that people love stories that you know uh, have a bit of accountability not just informing, but if a bit of a, not a scandal, but there has to be something, and that's very hard to figure out. Can, can As an editor, to be honest with you, every single day somebody sends me a story, and I do this a lot. I say to them, what's so special about it that I should know before I, I, I actually have my own thinking? And they, they usually have to tell me what they think. If they read it as, as a reader, what would you tell me? What is so special about it? How is it different from the story, for example, on Reuters? And when they tell that to me, I, normally when I go through as well, I try to compare and see where their thinking was. And it's very important for me to, uh, from an editorial judgment, to be able to engage with the journalist and not just send it out as an editor because this is what you think. Because the journalists probably speak to the audience and they know better, they've been on the ground, they've been researching. So for me, it's coming from an editorial judgment of thinking this is what the audience wants. Okay, we, 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 we're really running out of time. If there is anybody who wants to speak, ask a question from the floor, please signal. You probably will have to yell. But uh, otherwise, I'm going to ask Maggie. Um, okay. 
Well, I'll ask Maggie this question and then I'll take your question. Uh, how do you resist the pressure to uh, run stories that you know will attract hits, clickbait uh, stories? Yeah, how do you resist that, or do you resist that pressure? There's pressure on everyone. I don't know if I resisted that entirely, <laughs> but I try to. <laughs> we're still growing. I can't lie to you. We need to be out there, and we are not a well-established, twenty-year, thirty-year-old media house. We're just four years old, and the internet is very important to us, Peter, because uh, obviously we're digital. We need the audiences. So I don't know if we've. Uh, what, what, what we've done is, for me, I love um, organic engagement. It's not about advertising, it's not about pushing the story, it's about the feedback that is organic from the readers themselves. So I take away the clicks and the boosts, and I look at you know, that kind of engagement that we get from different uh, platforms we push. Yeah. But, but th there is a pressure to please the audience yeah, hey, and, yeah, get the, and run the stories. Yeah. There okay. is. <laughs> Can I just ask you a question, Ian? Sorry, you've got four journalists, and one's going to ask yes. you a question back. <laughs> Um, you work for, sorry, Frederick, welcome to you. You work for <laughs> Travel Weekly, yeah. which is owned by Jacobs Media. Yeah. Uh, they have conferences, they run, you know, they have agendas. Um, how does that affect you as a, as a journalist? Of, of course it affects us. In, in terms of the news, we keep a um, uh, separation between advertising and editorial. And if there is, if we run advertorial, it's clearly uh, labelled and must look different from the editorial. Um, when we run events, we don't charge for events, but they're, so they're, the, the model is sponsorship. And as much as possible, I try and separate the panels I'm responsible for. I try and separate sponsors from speakers. Uh, but sometimes that's not that's not possible. And you know, like everything else, it, you you are forced to compromise. Uh, can continually. There is a tension the whole time and you, you walk a tightrope yeah. uh, continually uh, negotiating it. Thank you, Ian. We'll, okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to... <laughs> Frederick. We're just going to Frederick. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, yeah. It's, so, okay. Well, so we, we, we kind of, we dealt with that a little bit. Uh, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I want to ask Peter something and maybe the rest of you would, would answer. When, when, when we spoke briefly be, be, before the, the, this event, Peter, you said you're the, the people, but by this I mean, I think you mean your, your audience as well, are not really relating to these questions, as in questions of sustainable tourism. Well, they're not relating to them because they don't understand the definition. Mm. We haven't, we have I, I think I said this originally, we have not done our best job right. in explaining to them what this means to them. It happens when you have natural disasters. When a volcano erupted in Iceland in 2010, all of a sudden people figured out why they weren't getting their food delivery or why medical supplies weren't being transported because the airline system shut down for five days. Right now, even in, in Paris, you know, the Nord Stream gets shut down and all of a sudden, well, maybe we'll only light the Eiffel Tower for an hour tonight. Right? All, then all, maybe they can connect the dots. But you have to understand that people are selfish. Right? It's all in their self-interest. So you have to make it relatable to them in their own homes, in their own environment, as to, you ask kids today where food comes from or where water comes from, they tell you the store. I got a problem with that. And if you don't understand the process, you can't, you can't relate or respect the product. So if we don't tell them about the process, we've not done our work. Okay. Uh, I want to ask a pretty much a final question and then give you all of a final word. I'll put this first to you, uh, Rajan. It, it, we can't really have this discussion unless we talk about media ownership, can we? And the concentration of, of media ownership. And that doesn't just mean traditional media, that means the, the online platforms, because everything has to go through Google or Facebook in order for the people to find your site uh, anyway. And that's a huge issue, isn't it, in terms of getting the message across about sustainable... Uh, tourism and almost everything else. Well, it relates to what we were talking about before about you know if there are if if a, a media outlet is in some way tied up with a, a commercial venture, then you know I mean let's mention it. If it's a Murdoch-owned uh, newspaper, then there's a Murdoch agenda. We know that he he will go into or he used to anyway go into the newsroom and say I want this story to be the top story and I want you know and so yes that that is going to happen. Ultimately, though, you know, the BBC, you mentioned that the BBC is still in the 
in the game of winning audiences, and um, so you, it's you know it's not that the BBC is necessarily always right about these things and always pure about what it does. Just try, and I you know I think that's that's the point. But but no ownership of media is obviously uh, an issue. I mean CBS is owned by who? CBS is owned by Viacom, which is owned by a, a family it. called the Redstones. And once again, it's no different than the Murdochs when you understand there is influence being exerted within those walls, right? It goes back to the days of yellow journalism. Remember those? Yellow journalism and the Hearst Papers in the Spanish-American War, right? I mean, William Randolph, they wanted to start a war with, 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 with Spain, and so they invented, you know, the, uh, the Maine being sunk in the harbor in Havana. It was the front page of every Hearst paper in America. Next thing you know, we declared war because it's what the family wanted. Now, hopefully, we've, we've made some improvements since then. We're not st necessarily starting wars. Well, well, I don't know. The Iraq War, weapons of mass destruction? Uh, so I think no, we weapons of mass exactly. distraction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Maggie, did you want to say anything on this? Yeah, I, I really, I really want to go back to those days. I never was part of those days, but I, f I feel like it was proper journalism. Uh, I've tried to go to a club before with my notebook to get stories, and you have no idea what I went through. But so you want to go back to a time before the internet? No, before the internet, I feel like it's 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 Ooh. fascinating when you hear Peter Ooh. say it. But now I'm coming to the part. For you me. have to learn shorthand. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah, for me, I think um, you mentioned something that is very important on how you convey the message. And it's, it's very critical about media and journalism at this point. And I know we had this, this discussion yesterday. I don't think we agreed, but we're going to have to agree to disagree or the other way around. Um, I think we have to, to take away the word innovation that you hate, be a bit creative on how we convey the message. The audience has become so impatient. It has become so uh, short-sighted. Like they don't want to read. They don't like long videos. They don't like long interviews. And for me, that keeps me up all the time. Like being able to convey the message in a more snappy, creative, easy way. That if I sent it to thousands of people on WhatsApp, can it convey the message? If I speak to Peter for one hour, can I take that message and put it in 45 seconds? Because I know my audience probably won't even listen to five minutes of that message. And for me, I think that's probably what we need to figure out. It's not about really informing. I think that part, the journalists are doing such a fantastic job. But the part of really getting the audience engaged and, under, and being able to get them to listen, to understand, and get them hooked, I think, is the part that, for me, even right now, as we move ahead, that we need to really figure out. It's attention span. 10 years ago, I could do a piece on CBS I could actually do eight or nine minutes. I did one today from the room right upstairs uh, here. It was three minutes and six seconds. And that was considered... That's long. That's long. Yeah, that's yeah. long. We but, do 30 seconds. But look, look, th this is not a new pressure. Where, where did tabloid newspapers come from? You know, tabloid newspapers have been around for 60 y years. Short, 300-word uh, stories and, and so on. And the problem with it with short stories, short videos is, they only really work if you're reflecting what people already think. They don't work if you're challenging, because it, it takes a, a bit longer to present an argument that, that's convincing to people. So, but the tension, the pressure for that is, n is not new. Sherry, I wanted to give you a chance, and then I'll take a final word from, uh, from everyone before we wrap up. I think, I think I don't Hold know the if the world is, I think when you give people too much information, it's, it's like a culture shock for them and they can't, they can't deal with it, so they turn it off. You know, and they, they, don't want it, they don't want to know about war, they don't want to know about famine, they don't want to know about climate change. They want to know about what's on TV, when are we going to eat, what's at the movies, and what, 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 what football game we're going to go to. And that's really what it's come down to, because they're, you can't give them anything that is going to be too hard for them to handle, because there's such a thing as cognitive dissonance, and they, they, if people don't want to believe what they believe, what they've always believed is wrong. Okay. And to them, because it'll be like a culture shock, and that, they'll, they'll freak. Uh, that's a very pessimistic view, but uh, the point about cognitive dissonance surely is where uh, people uh, aren't interested in things that don't appear to reflect the reality of their lives. That's surely the the point, and so you know, having. 
having media that reflect more the lives of ordinary people and how climate change will affect their families, their children, their, all the rest of it, surely is the, is the way forward. A final word to, to each of you. Peter. Well, I go back to something else. The name of this conference is A World for Travel. And I'm going to talk about something that I'm not in control of and I don't think I can fix. And present company excluded, so I'm not talking about you. <laughs> but most Americans are the most geographically ignorant people on the face of the planet. Neem, they don't even know where New York is, right? <laughs> they don't. And I can't fix that. But what I can fix is how it relates to their lives, how it relates to their personal experience. And if you want to present a country, whether it's, you know, Senegal or, or Hawaii, it's going to be based on experience. It can't be based on destination. It can't be based on anything other than here's what you can do that you can't do anywhere else or you can't do anywhere else better. And if you could include in that, you could be responsible at the same time and deal with sustainable issues, then you've won. But if you try to just uh, talk about what we've always talked about, right? Let, oh, go to this place because it's great. It means nothing. Or this, oh, we have a great sunset here. They have a great sunset over a nuclear toxic waste dump. You just don't want to be there. But the point is, you have to deal with experience and not geography. And nobody suffers more than that than Africa. Nobody. Okay. There are 54 countries in Africa, and I challenge anybody here, with maybe one Might exception, <laughs> to name them. Let, let's go to Maggie next then, and then Roger. Oh, um. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, want me, do you want me to answer Peter? No, oh, no, 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 no. You can okay, answer, so, this is your um, final words. So yeah, you I, I, I think we really have to be very intentional about reporting on climate change and uh, sustainability. We've been very intentional about you know, investment, about trade. Even right now, if you go to the internet or anywhere, you just see Elon Musk, you just see stocks flying all over again. How do we make travel attractive? How do you get so intentional about putting the word there? It's not, it's not just about, because at the end of the day, it is, it is, it's, it's impacting our societies, communities. I, I come from Africa where, for me, travel is luxury, but the people working within travel, it's not a luxury for them. The wages and labor, it's not attractive for them. So how do we change and turn that around? And that starts with us, you know, media, journalists, to be intentional in the stories that we put out, and in the information that you know we, we just put out in the world. So for me, my last word is that we just have to be intentional about reporting on travel, uh, reporting on climate change and sustainability, and there's absolutely no way. I mean, you know how the media is. If the story is out there every other day, at the end of the day, you're gonna love it. You're gonna, you're gonna find it attractive. But if it's there only once in a while, you're gonna forget it. Yeah, but the, the whole point about uh, online is that, uh, the, the story that's up there now won't be up there in two minutes but, but because this another is not, story yeah, is But not this is not just even online alone. It's also in the papers. It's everywhere. We just have to be intentional about it. Okay. Sherry, final word. What do you want to say? Um, I think that with, with this whole wor world of you know, term of sustainability and climate change, everyone freaks out. We're all going to die. You know, save the planet. It's not saving the planet. We're, we're, it's an arthropogenic climate change. The world will always regenerate itself. We have to save ourselves and care for each other and really take heed of what, what we say and, and how we do it. And we have to be intentional, like Maggie said. We have to make our words count and matter, and they have to mean something. Okay. Very good. Rajan, final word. I'm just going to say one thing, which is I'm very conscious of it. Four journalists here. There may be some journalists in the audience. Five. But, but uh, five. I beg your pardon. Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was excluding myself. <laughs> um, journalism is, believe it or not, a noble tradition. It's a noble job. You, we know it. We have it in our blood that we have to be absolutely spot on with this story, that we will give it our ultimate you know, give it integrity. And if you look at all surveys about journalists, so you look at the, the way they're depicted in the media, I mean, they are the scum of the earth. And that, that is something we have to face up. They're down there with mass murderers and, and, and lawyers. And, you know, and, it's <laughs> and that image has to change. And I think the problem, the, the, partly that comes from the blurring of the line between opinion and news. And that is a dangerous line that is actually getting worse, I, if worse is the right word to use that, yeah. It, it probably is getting worse, but look, look, 
journalists have referred to themselves as hacks for a long time, and that's not, you know... Speak that's for yourself. Not, yeah, that's not, that's not, doesn't dignify the, the job, does it? Look, please thank Peter, Rajan, Maggie, and Sherry. Thank you.